Sean would face down here. This is take two. I actually messed up and was asking him some questions about unwritten law yes. and totally, totally messed the whole interview up. So take two. Uh, Sean would face down, and I'm with one of the members of the band Authority Zero, who's one of my personal favorites. And you are? I'm Jason. I right, sing in the band. Excellent. Uh, now, you guys started back in 94 in high school. Uh, did you guys ever think you would make it this far? Nope. In all reality, again, we uh, we pretty much started out just messing around, just had nothing really better to do because we were just a bunch of kids, you know, skating and smoking cigarettes and listening to punk rock music. And we got into it just for fun and to kind of fill our time. And uh, just the idea of maybe we can do something musically whatsoever, which we really couldn't too much at the time, you know. So that being said, when we started out, you know, we had no real lifetime goals or achievements that we wanted to do with the group because um, we didn't really fit at the time, especially into any certain click or scene or anything like that would be punk or metal or whatever was going on, reggae, anything like that. Because um, we were just kind of all over the map and we didn't really know what the hell we were doing. So, so um, again, as time went by, um, we started realizing we were onto something a little more than just, you know, kind of messing around and, you know, doing whatever. So, um, again, with all the, the, the band's been through for, you know, it's been 16 years now. I mean, five years ago, I could have probably told you it was going to be over five years ago. You know, so to be here now. Actually, uh, I used to listen to the uh, Sirius Radio channel. Um, I forgot what it was called, but uh, Shannon Guns was on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And she was like a big fan of you guys and used to play, play you guys constantly. And that's how I actually got into you guys. Oh, that's cool. Shannon's a great girl, man. She really did a lot of, you know, a lot of help for us on Sirius, like supported us 100. percent And then some, you know, pushed us as hard as she could with those guys. So much props to you, Shannon. Thanks, girl. <laughs> Now, your debut album that was on Lava Records, A Passage in Time, which included the hits One More Minute and Over Seasons, what was the inspiration behind that album? Um, a lot of that album, actually half of that album, was part of an EP we did uh, probably about a year and a half before that called Patches in Time. And um, it was about six or seven songs that, again, came from just like our childhood, like growing up songs we'd written throughout that growing phase uh, of being a band. And we kind of picked and chose you know, which we thought were more solid songs than the other ones we had, and um, wrote other songs just within that same time frame, you know, as we got older, and uh, a lot of the inspiration was really just our day-to-day -day lives, and just, you know, working, going to school, you know, you know, the uh, the idea of rebelling against your parents, and just authority in general, honestly, like, you know, as cliche as it sounds, but we just wanted to do what we wanted to do, and, um, you know, stuff like One More Minute came from precisely that as well, we'd make trips to Rocky Point all the time, and in San Diego and just go and, and try and get away and it's based around like not wanting to go back from that you know good time with your buddies and kind head of back like to the work. weekend warrior thing yeah and then all of a sudden you gotta go back and it's like oh you know whatever so it's a lot of, you know all of that all that first time was purely life experiences you know ups and downs of everything that's going on as kids so now uh, why did you guys decide to leave Lava, Lava Records and uh, how did it come about uh, joining Suburban Noise Records um actually with Lava um, we got signed on with them for a two record contract. So it was that one and Andiamo. And typical major label shit, you know, sorry. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't sell a million records. They're not going to really pay you no mind. You know, they, there's a lot of things that they wanted us to do promotional wise that, that came about. And we didn't want to do everything the direction they were thinking of taking it. So we would, you know, we cut it, but we like, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to do this. And it wasn't a lot of what they had in mind for us. And so, uh, in their eyes, it probably led up to why we didn't do as many record sales, you know, which was fine by us. Um, but when it came time for the second album to come out, uh, they kind of gave it a push, but not really. Um, certainly not as much as the first album. And it, it basically came to, you know, what happens to a lot of bands. We just got dropped from, you know, the major label. You know, and we're like, all right, well, you know, that's not it for us. We're not done yet. And so we uh, <clears throat> put another record together, 1234. Oh, Rhythm and Booze, actually, first. So I'm back up. Uh, we just got lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the first uh, was Suburban Noise, how we kind of got first interacting with them was we did a live acoustic album of uh, songs off our first two albums uh, and did a live show called Rhythm and Booze. And Kevin Zinger, uh, we, uh, we, I can't remember if we approached him or he approached us, but he'd always been a fan of the band, he said, and uh, he was more than willing to put out a live acoustic album, which was ridiculous to think that any record label would be willing to do that for, you know, for any band, really. And uh, he did it. And it was probably one of the you know better pushed albums in the last couple of years for us. And um, shortly after that, we put together 1234, which we did with Ryan Green and Miguel uh, Happold, who uh, is the guy that produced uh, a lot of the Sublime stuff back in the day. So nice. they kind of did a collaboration on that record. And our management at the time, we had no way of really putting the record out. 
Um, so we, we thought about some broken noise at the time. We're like, well, let's try something else first before we go that route again. And then our management put a label, a label together called Big Panda Records, uh, which was one of those kind of like things that kind of comes back and it kind of made us in the ass a little bit because it's, you know, it's a uh, it's, uh, confusion of, you know, who's doing what role in what part of the company, you know, you can have your manager doing this and their label and you have your lawyer involved, it's, you know, it's just a freaking mess. And, end result, it ended up coming back and kicked us in the ass a little bit. Um, so we did that one record with them and then, you know, went through some uh, some band member changes for that next couple of years, which was a pretty shaky time for us, trying to get everything figured out and see what we were going to do. And we uh, got it all figured out, got it put together, and uh, recorded Stories of Survival. And um, again, Fletcher then from Pennywise approached us during the recording process with uh, Ken Seaton from Harland Entertainment, which is a management company again, which was kind of weird. First two, we brought that up, but um, with Fletcher being involved as well as uh, Suburban Noise, they wanted to do kind of a branch off with Fletcher's label called Viking like, Funeral Records. So uh, that's how that all came back into play again, and Kevin Zinger was still like all about it. You know, there was no hard feelings for us not using you know, the label for the previous record, um, and he was gung ho about releasing this record with us again, so that's how we got to where we're at with this one. Now, um, this is one of my daughter's favorite songs, so what is the meaning behind your song, Sirens? Sirens is almost like a, just really a unified, you know, unified thing for, for the kids in the community. You know, it's all the kids coming up to punk shows, and just people that have questions about anything and want to say something, and a lot of times don't, and they keep themselves with it and keep their own ideals kind of locked away. It's more about kind of a unified, you know, voice. The sense the sirens of the kids, you know, in the streets shouting, you know, stop their lungs. Now, what makes Authority Zero happy? Uh, this is it, man, right here. Honestly, it's like a lot of people would say, you know, uh, probably going home and taking some time off. But I mean, we're still, you know, this many years later, we just enjoy nothing more than getting on the road and seeing, you know, seeing the kids' reactions. You know, more so each time we come around to the shows. You know, the kids still into the music after 10 years. I mean, we just did our first tour ever in Europe, and. Uh, you know, there's kids that are like in Belgium. They're like, they're like, what happened to you guys? Like, we're, you know, we thought you'd never come. And I'm just like, well, thanks for 10 years later still being into the music, you know, because I mean, a lot of kids just forgot about it and moved on. So just that's that's the driving force that makes us happy is just like, you know, seeing that reaction at all the shows after the, you know, seven eight hour drives to get to that venue and it makes it all worthwhile. At the time. Nice. Now, what is your favorite part of actually touring? Um, that's probably it, honestly, right there. I mean, a big part of it is huge for me is just getting to see new places, you know, and, and not just because you're paying for a ticket to go on vacation somewhere, it's for the fact that you play music and people actually give shit about it when you hear it. So that's the huge part for me, and that just kind of goes right back in with the people who come out to the shows that, you know, you're, you're touching them in some weird way with your music, and when they talk to you about what may have, your music, how it may have impacted their life in some form or another. Nice. Now, what are your views as a punk rock band and modern day society? Uh, views such as just like how the scene is and everything or um, I think it's I feel like it's maybe coming back around which I really hope it is it feels like it is you know I mean it's obviously there's like a long dry spell it felt like with uh, a lot of the emo hardcore scene that happened you know and warp Tour bands changed the whole warp Tour changed obviously you know and it made it hard for a lot of bands like us and, and other bands to be accepted because it's just a new generation in general you know it's totally fine because in some ways that's to a lot of kids they're, they're new punk rock you know, outlet. That's like their, you know, their version of it nowadays. So, um, I think it's, I think it's coming back. I hope it's, I hope it's coming back. You know, we're still out there working. We know a lot of bands out there from different areas that are out there busting their ass. You know, trying to, trying to make the music known and, and keep, you know, bring the sound back and bring that whole community back together. So, it's open, man. Just keep on pushing. Now, in uh, 2008, uh, Bill Marks decided to leave the band. What was the story behind that? Well, last two years before, about two years before he left, he left the band. Maybe a year and a half. He he gave us a heads up that <clears throat> he's like, you know, I got a family now. I got, you know, my wife. I got two kids, and you know, everything like that. And you know, being in a band like ours, you don't make a whole lot of money. You know, especially in this day and age with the way the music, you know, music industry is. It's like you make your money at the shows, and that entails you being away from your family, obviously, and new loved ones back home. So um, he's like, you know, things aren't, you know, up and up and up and up and up. You know, to a really uh, substantial you know point to survive, you know, happily. Um, you know, and, and uh, able to support his family that he's like, I just want to let you guys know so there's no surprises that I'll have to take off. And he's like, cool, no, no, you know, no, no, no worries there, man. It's like totally respectable and understandable. So, uh, the time came, uh, that exact, you know, time frame kind of went by and then, you know, he kind of gave us, like, this will be our last show. 
and I was like, I, I totally get it, you know, we all kind of got it, and uh, unfortunately, that ended up being a whirlwind, which was the last three years of interchanging members and trying to figure out what, who fit where, and, you know, you know who was going to be around for the long run with it, and who was, uh, who was right for the, in, uh, the spot, really, you know, I think we kind of slowly started getting that figured out again, because it also, uh, Jeremy Wood had left the band prior to, to that uh, with Bill, because um, of some band discrepancies, you know, and so uh, him taking off brought Jeremy Woods back into the band as well. So we're kind of back to a three-piece original. It, you know, you don't count the first few drummers we went through when we were young kids, um, and we just have a new guitar player now. He's actually been with us for about six days, uh, no, six six show dates. So yeah, he's a cool guy named Brandon. So he's uh, he's been playing on guitar for now. Now, how did you guys decide to blend your genre with, with punk, rock, reggae, with a hint of the Spanish and Portuguese sound? Um, how did you guys come up with that idea of style of music? Uh, that all leads back again to just, you know, what I said in the beginning. With, we had uh, really no idea what the hell we were doing when we were kids. You know, we were honestly just playing from all aspects of all of our individual influences. Like, I was, you know, I was big in skate and, you know, like a lot of the old bad wood and stuff and, like, you know, skate punk stuff, you know, and Jim was into hardcore hip-hop, you know, and uh, Bill was always really into blues, you know, big into Chili Peppers and stuff like that, and uh, he also ma uh, majored in Spanish and uh, had to do Portuguese as well and studied abroad in Spain for some time while we were still together, so uh, just all those different elements, and Jeremy's into metal, you know, so it's like all those elements just kind of, instead of being like, we have to start a punk band, we have to start this, we have to do this, you know, cookie-cutter thing, we just kind of did what came naturally and just threw weird elements into weird spots that usually wouldn't make any sense at all, timing-wise even. So we just kind of did what we always felt came naturally and did what we wanted to do. That was it. So. Uh, this is just a just a whim question. Uh, who do you think would win in a fight, Charlie Sheen or Mel Gibson? Ooh, dude. <laughs> um, I almost think that one could be a draw because they're both pretty out there, man. I think, I think probably... Charlie Sheen, for some reason, he looks a little crazy. <laughs> he, like, he probably just would, just would not stop until he was probably dead. Plus being hopped up on all that cooking. Yeah, <laughs> you keep firing away, I'm sure. <laughs> Alright, and uh, what what goals do you guys are trying to achieve uh, with, with your band for the future? Um, you know, again, hopefully keep on touring. Hopefully, you know, get to more places. You know, we want to hit up Australia still and just a lot more places around the world. Um, as many as we can, South America, all that. Uh, release, you know, release another record, hopefully in the next year. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. We've been doing some writing and stuff too, and hopefully, just in, you know, the main goal is, you know, always kind of been to inspire people, in, in more than anything, you know, in either the, the the workforce, you know, just to do things they think they can do to help other people in, in certain situations, and and just again, just really inspire people, hopefully, to do music or otherwise, you know. And last but not least, uh, what does the future hold for you guys? Uh, you're talking about a new album coming out hopefully soon. Um, what other tours, any other videos, DVDs, side projects? What can your fans expect? Um, a lot from side projects. I mean, Jim's got some stuff going on uh, called Blue Collar, yeah, Blue, Collar, Blue Collar Profit that he does. It's a lot of drum and bass kind of stuff. But he's getting ready to release some stuff. Um, I do solo acoustic albums. I just released my second one, Conviction 2. Nice. Uh, something I've kind of been doing for the last four years. And... Um, another side band called The Bollocks. It's like an Irish folk punk band. You know, that me and my buddies do. My buddy uh, from Ireland and I kind of started that up. And uh, with Authority, first and foremost, it's just, again, just keep on writing songs on the road and then head back and do some demo work between tours and try and put an album out in the next year. And yeah, hopefully year and a half at most. Definitely. I'm definitely excited for that. Like I said, I'm a big, big fan of you guys. Uh, Thanks, if you guys have not checked out Authority Zero, you guys need to definitely do that. These guys are fucking amazing. Again, thank you for taking the time thank to do you, this bro. interview. Appreciate it. And face down is out. Yeah.